Good afternoon, everyone. I am Associate Artistic Director Celine Rosenthal, and I am pleased to welcome you to this special live Knoxville discussion, our first ever online event presented by our Artistic Excellence Society. This intimate group of patrons is committed to supporting the producing artistic director in choosing shows that exemplify a spirit of risk-taking and innovation. Donations allow for higher production values, stellar creative teams, and the development of new works. If you're not an artistic society, artistic excellence society member, and would like to learn more about this special donor group, please visit www.oscillarep.org, click support us, and then individual giving from the drop-down menu. We're so thankful to all the members of the Artistic Excellence Society, as well as our board members watching today. Thank you for all you do for Oslo Rep every day. We couldn't do this without you. The world premiere of Knoxville, now opening in May of 2021, is made possible by a generous grant from the Roy Cockrum Foundation, who once again stepped forward to help reunite some of the most gifted theater artists working in America today. At the end of this conversation, we'll answer a few questions. So if you have a YouTube account, you can post them in the comment section at any time during this discussion. And now let's introduce the speakers. Director and book writer Frank Galati is an Oslo Rep associate artist in his eighth season with us. Among his many productions, our audiences have enjoyed his work on Rhinoceros, Little Foxes, 1776, My Fair Lady, and 12 Angry Men. He is a member of the Steppenwolf Theater Company, and over the years, he's received nine Jeff Awards for his work in the Chicago Theater. He won two Tony Awards for his adaptation and direction of The Grapes of Wrath and was nominated again for his direction of Ragtime. His work has been seen at such distinguished venues as Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Berkeley Rep, the Metropolitan Opera, and the Roundabout Theater in New York. He was nominated for an Academy Award for his screenplay of The Accidental Tourist. And in the year 2000, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And we are so blessed that he lives here in Sarasota. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Galati. Hello. hello. Hi, Frank. Celine, how are you? I'm so well. It's so wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see you. Pretend I embrace. Oh, yes, I shall pretend and embrace back. <laughs> like this beautiful theater that we're uh, enclosed in, in the yes. frame. Yes, it's, that's a it's, shot of the merch like an embrace it's beautiful yeah. how are you today and how is your technology treating you uh, my technology thanks to these earphones seems to be treating me pretty well <laughs> uh, I, i'm comfortable i've sort of learned how to use this so it's a lot of fun wonderful well thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today it's a real pleasure sure. a pleasure and um now I'm going to introduce lyricist Lynn Ahrens and composer Stephen Flaherty, who have been collaborators in musical theater since 1983 for Broadway's Ragtime, directed by Frank Galati. They won the Tony Award, Drama Desk, and Outer Critics Circle. They wrote the song score for the 20th Century Fox animated feature Anastasia, earning two Academy Award nominations and two Golden Globe nominations, and adapted the hit musical for the Broadway stage. Their credits also include Once on This Island, Seussical, Rocky, Cheetah Rivera, The Dancer's Life, Lincoln Center Theater's My Favorite Year, A Man of No Importance, Dessa Rose, The Glorious Ones, Lucky Stiff, and the upcoming Marie. Honors include the Oscar Hammerstein Award for Lifetime Achievement, London's Olivier Award, and four Grammy nominations. In 2015, they were inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2020 Ruby and Carol Crosby Family Foundation guest musical artists, Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty. Hi. Hello. Hi. Welcome, hey. welcome to our virtual tete-a-tete. -tete. How are you? It's great. I think You're good. I'm, I'm sort of in the virtual mezzanine, I think. Looks like on my screen. <laughs> I actually like it up here. It's really nice. <laughs> Where are each of you calling from? I'm calling from the Berkshires in upstate New York. And if you want to ask me about technology, 
don't get me started. <laughs> it is, <laughs> it's the worst up here. And I may, you know, you may lose me and I may come back. Oh, don't even ask. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you even under these circumstances. to be here, even if I may be vanishing every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll wait for you to come back. And how about you, Stephen? Where are you calling us from? Uh, I'm calling uh, from my uh, home in Mexico. I'm in Puerto Vallarta right now. And uh, yeah, so uh, my husband and I have a place down here and, and uh, it's, uh, it's nice and sunny and we're just, you know, away from everybody right now, you know, so uh, knock wood, the technology here is, it's actually a better connection than I have in Manhattan. So, so we're doing, we're doing okay. And I'm just like getting to, to know, you know, what, all, what a stream yard is and what a zoom is and you know it's a brave new world and you know here we are but it's it's wonderful to be able to be here today and have uh, this conversation in our little virtual theater well thank you both of you so much for doing this today it's an absolute treat to talk to you and thank you for chatting with me and our digital audience so frank why don't we begin at the beginning uh what Prior to this production, what was your relationship to James Agee's novel, and how did you begin thinking about it as a theatrical piece? I read the book when I was pretty young. Uh, I, I was in college. Uh, you know, some things that we read uh, stay with us. They slumber inside of us as we go on about our lives. And uh, this, this story, the story of this family, this kid who goes through some tough times uh, about the age of six and uh, becomes an artist, becomes a writer. Uh, so it was a story that always was very close to my heart. And then it was published in the late 50s. And then in the early 60s, I was in a summer theater company in Pennsylvania, mm. uh, in um, uh, Eagles, Eaglesmere, Pennsylvania. And uh, on the bill, the one summer, I was there two summers, one summer was the play adaptation of this novel by James Agee. The novel's title is A Death in the Family. Mm. Kind of forbidding, not very inviting. Mm. Uh, the play's title was uh, changed to the last line of the novel, which is All the Way Home, mm. which is a, be a beautiful evocation of uh, what the story is about. Anyway, in this summer theater, I was uh, on crew. So I saw the play over and over and over again and in rehearsals. And I, it was really compelling. I, I was mesmerized by the characters, but there were things about the play that I, I, I thought were um, insufficient. Hmm. cumbersome, clumsy, uh, not comfortably situated in a stage space, very earthbound in a kitchen, uh, hmm. growing out of the traditions of realistic Chekhovian theater. Uh, but the, the novel transports the reader by means of the narrator to numerous locations, jumps in time, and uh, uh, passages that penetrate deeply into the head of this kid who's yeah. growing up and learning language and lear learning the, the mystery and profundity of life. Uh, so, I, I liked the play a lot, but I thought uh, somewhere always in the back of my mind, I thought, gee, I'd love to go back to the novel and see if I could do an adaptation that actually accommodated some of these other aspects. Mm -hmm. So I did a draft just for my own amusement. Mm -hmm. And I uh, 
felt it was insufficient. It was too abbreviated. Uh, it, it wasn't a full meal. It was a, a, a light lunch. <laughs> so, so I wrote to my beloved friends, Lynn and Stephen, on the outside chance that they might have any interest in this. I felt very kind of presumptuous of approaching them, thinking, oh, they'll think, oh, what is he crazy? <laughs> uh, so I sent, I sent it to them and uh, wow, I was kind of surprised mm. by the response. Lynn, <laughs> <laughs> over to you. <laughs> what? what well, <laughs> what did I you know? What, no, what, what, what I think you're asking when yeah. Frank brought this. To I, I thought, I thought, I don't care if it's the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> I would like to do another show with Frank Galati before I die. <laughs> That's really what I thought. I, I was so happy. <laughs> I was so happy to hear from him. Yes. And so, you know, in, in the theater, um, people that you love and relate to and can work with and collaborate with and you know you have uh, the same kind of sensibility they're 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 hard to find i'm not saying they're few and far between but they're hard to find and when you do find those people that you just love and you just want to go work with them time and time again you know you you try to do that and frank is one of those people and that, I, I also think that's why steven and i have been working together for more than 30 years you know it's it's you just you just grab onto those people who, um, who, you know, turn you on and who right. are creatively on your wavelength. And Frank is definitely one of those people. And we haven't seen him. Uh, I haven't for a, a long time, but you know, mm -hmm. he's always in my heart. And uh, when the phone rang, uh, you know, I, I plotted as my grandmother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, Frank is. Not, not to like butter you up, but I'm going to. Uh, th there's something so inspiring uh, about being in the room with, with Frank and it's very exciting. And it's, it's not like, oh, let's do a musical. It's like, let's create this really unique piece of theater that's based on literature. And that's really what Frank does so brilliantly. And the opportunity to have, you know, a new piece uh, and to work with Frank, that we were so excited by that. It, it took me a, a while to find the music in it, I have to say, mm. uh, because I thought it was so beautifully done. And I thought, how would music function in this piece? You know, what would it bring to the piece? Because uh, the language is quite lyrical already, you know, and it's like when you hear uh, of certain very lyrical pieces then being transferred into opera, and you're thinking, like, it's sort of musical already, you know? So we actually, uh, jumped off knowing that we wanted to really work with Frank, but we talked a long time about the characters and how music would function and what would it do. And uh, as the piece began to reveal itself, it was a lot of the music was about what people were feeling, but not necessarily saying. So it's mm -hmm. about what you have in your in your heart. And you know, the, the scene might be about, do you want two pancakes or three? But really the emotion is about all of these things that are unsaid. And when we stumbled upon that notion, uh, the floodgates really opened and then the music poured out, you know, and you always need to, to find that little key into the piece. So I just, I just wanted, wanted to, to yeah. I just wanted to interject that on this, on this technological, technological crazy, crazy thing, thing. Um, that, that one day recently, Stephen said to me, um, I found the email. And I said, what email is that? he's a Virgo so he saves everything and he, <laughs> he everything and he found this email that I had apparently written to him at some point that she said I think the songs don't have to be the kind of character songs that we're used to writing I don't even know what I wrote they they should just be sort of songs that inform the scene and the character but without you know the character having to sing sort of a meat and potatoes song I, I i honestly don't know what i said but he he has that email for the i should for the archives <laughs> I, should, I should dig it out live on our little yeah but i was so excited to see that i go lynn look this is yeah and and if you look at the time that we started talking to frank to the time we went on to that it, it was probably like a year you know and it was so interesting yeah. i said oh this is the moment where we turned it around, where we understood what it was going to to be, and uh, 
you know, I, it, it was exciting to, to find that again and to like really see, you know, what were the first first notes that we wrote? What was the first impulse? How did it develop then? What were they? The first, well, Lynn had written uh, an opening that was uh, called Knoxville that was based on, uh, you know, the, the prologue. The prologue. And, the prologue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, and over time, it, it changed quite a bit because it was more like an art song and there wasn't any repeated passage. And, and I, I kept thinking that we needed, <laughs> we needed something to hang our hat on, you know, <laughs> what's the repeated thing? What's the hook? And then, you know, we of course realize it's the, it's the word Knoxville and that's the town and that's the people's identity and, and how every sight and smell and whatever is in their lives, it's all a part of that. And then we began to build on that. And uh, yeah, so that was, the, that was the musical way in, into it. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. And Lynn, I know that you've spoken about certain passages in the novel specifically inspiring you towards a musical moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples right. of some of the most potent examples? Yes, I can. Be because I just happened to write some down. <laughs> so I would have them. Because I had a feeling you would ask me You're that. Ready. Um, no, no. <laughs> I was You're prepared. So no, I'll just... The, 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 um, the uh, beautiful thing about this, the novel, the source material, you know, the source material is always the Bible for the musical theater writer. It's the source of the characters, it's the source of the plot. And we take songs and, you know, and, and do mush around with it and, and make it into a different art form. But um, I think I, somebody said once, art is a conversation through the ages. And that's what I feel musical theater is. It's a conversation with, with text. It's a conversation with um, art. It's, uh, you know, always weaving those things together. and. The, the novel of Knoxville, of um, A Death in the Family that, that our show is based on, has the most poetic passages, I think, of any book that we've ever adapted. And we've adapted a lot of very, very famous authors from E.L. Doctorow to um, uh, Shirley Ann Williams to, you know, just a lot Francine prose. But, but this book has, has what is the closest to poetry. And you read it on the page. And I'll, ju I'll just read you one little tiny thing. So this is um, a moment in the novel when uh, the father, whose name is Jay, has just learned that he has to go off on a uh, three o'clock in the morning trip to his parents' house because his father may or may not be dying. And so he's getting dressed and he's putting on his collar and his tie and his pocket handkerchief and his jacket and his suspenders and his pants and, his, and he's getting dressed uh, and his wife is downstairs cooking and um, he looks out the window. And this is, this is the kind of stuff that makes me want to write a song. Mm -hmm. He only saw the window tenderly alight within and the infinite dark leaning like water against its outer surface. And even the window was not a window, but something extraordinarily vivid and senseless, which for the moment occupied the universe. And that became a lyric that goes, outside your window is nothing but night, night pushing in like the sea. Something inside you feels open and bright, face in such infinity. You must go, you must go. But then it calls you back again, this world inhabited by men, this world of buttonholes, shirt tails, and Sunday shoes, the smell of coffee on the air, and someone pausing on the stair as if she couldn't bear to know what she knows you'll choose. You must go. And that's, that's how a song is born. When you, somebody like me, who responds to language, reads it on the page and I go, there's a song, oh, there's a song. And, and I take it from wow. there. That, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, there you have it. And the book is full of those, that is, full of those plums, you know. It's fantastic, it's so moving. Wait. Stephen is talking. I can't hear him. I, I, was, oh, we can't hear this. I was on mute. Oh. I was saying, during oh. your reading of the lyric, uh, I actually found that original email. Can I read it? Oh, you did? I found it. I was like, I, sure. yeah, and I also finished the Times crossword puzzle as well. Virgo. So. <laughs> Virgo. Yes, Virgo. But here, here, I think, I think the, the, the viewers would get a, a real kick out of reading this. So I'm just, I'm just going to read this. So, okay. So here is an email that is dated September 21st, 2017 at 927 AM. It's from Lynn Aaron's written to me, written to me. Uh, Lynn says, uh, it occurred to me that many of the songs should be comments sung by the ensemble in reaction to, or intermingled with the scenes. 
the songs don't have to be specific to the scene, to the scenes. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they rather illuminate the emotions. Uh, they don't have to be book specific. Don't know if this makes any sense. I guess my instinct is just to ask you to write some great tunes for these <laughs> characters of all kinds and let me see what I can do. The scenes, <laughs> the, uh, the scenes will then support or comment on these songs. Uh, uh, I'm all. Uh, I'm also going to explore talking about mixing up the structure a bit. Uh, so basically, this is my collaborator saying, "Just give me, give me <laughs> tunes, give me emotion." <laughs> and, 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 I know what to do. And, and it's and it's interesting. I, I, like with yeah. with that kind of way, uh, I, I I really started writing for what felt uh, emotionally right for these people. But there are a lot of surprises along the way. For example, uh, there's uh, a scene towards uh, the end of the play where our uh, lead character, Mary, is uh, talking to Rufus, who is her six-year-old son, and explaining uh, where the, 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 the surprise comes from, which is the, the baby that, that will be arriving. And uh, I wrote a tune that was full of little short four note phrases that sounded to me like an adult speaking to a child. And the surprise was uh, that Lynn took the melody and she gave it to a completely different character. So she gave it to the character of Andrew, who is also speaking uh, to, the, to uh, our six year old Rufus. And uh, it became what I think is maybe my favorite song in the score, score is called The Butterfly. And it's, uh, it's a little monologue that he uh, musically uh, gives to the child that the child then joins in on the last line. And so I thought it was, it was interesting that this sketch written for one character was repurposed for another character. And, you know, that's part of the, the, the exciting thing for me. You know, we don't, we don't really set ourselves out, out like a list or a graph or, or even an outline. You know, we, we sort of go spontaneously, you know, from moment to moment. Mm. And that is fantastic. And it's, 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 I mean, it's such a, a, an amazing song, and it seems inevitable that that character would sing that in that moment. And in fact, the music was, I was thinking of somebody completely different. So, <laughs> and, it, may, may I just add uh, sure. parenthetically on this topic of this particular song? It's so mysterious to me how the two of you are able to match the, uh, it's hard to put into words, the kind of emotional, the, the simplicity of the emotional lift in that, in that song, which arrives at the whole hovering idea of faith and belief. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a very, it's, a, it's an uncle speaking to his nephew, and it's through the story that the uncle narrates that the little boy learns not only about how we have to accept death as a part of life, but also something about the shape of language and the shape of story. Because Lynn, when you are able to make it clear to the listener that the butterfly is descending on the coffin into the ground, and as simply as the language uh, expresses it in the novel, you, you do it in verse, and then uh, up comes <laughs> the soul itself. And it, it can't happen unless the structure is perfect. And the coalescence of the melody, the poetry, and the narrative truth coming from the source material of the novel is, it's an unbeatable combination. It's so moving to me. It's so, I think it's why we live. It's why we <laughs> tell stories. That's, it's why yes. we love what we do. Well, and Frank, you, 
you sort of lighted upon a question that I thought would be interesting for us to discuss with our audience. Within this play that lives in this musical, the characters are exploring the idea of, of faith in a lot of different ways. How, how is that important to you? And how is it uh, translated through these uh, words in these songs? Anyone? Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, I thought you were asking Frank. I'm so no, sorry. You were asking Frank? No. Uh, any, any, she, go ahead. I, I mean, well, she was asking you, Frank, but I will reply to <laughs> for a second. <laughs> I think that the, the whole notion of faith in this show is one of the things that attracted me, to be honest with you, because it's an ongoing um, question for me. Uh, and I'm interested in it. I'm interested in faith and, you know, the afterlife, if there is one or isn't one, I tend to doubt it, but you know, I'm, I remain, remains to be seen. Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a gorgeous, um, just a, a, a theme that floats through the show without getting hammered on the head. Right. You know, it's not, it's not about religion, but all of these characters are involved with religion in one way or another, in one belief system or another. And, um, it's, it's very interesting to me. So that's that's one of the things that I loved so much about about this project when Frank first bought it. It's it's it has so many levels of concern and um, questioning that yeah. I think is yeah. very rich. I'm just remembering in my own life the transfer from being an ardent uh, uh, Catholic boy. Mm -hmm. raised by Catholic nuns that uh, it was the theatricality of the, the religious experience that right. was always so thrilling to me. I love the costumes. I love the incense. <laughs> I know the incense I was great. The, <laughs> I loved all the rigmarole. But I also knew that in, in the core of it, there was this absolute conviction that there is a God and there is a Redeemer. And that is the nourishment to keep us go going in our lives. But I gave up the church for the theater which is just another kind of church. Another, it's right. another hallowed hall. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's an act of faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, for, I, sure. I, to, I totally, my background is so similar to yours because I'm Irish Catholic. And I remember being an altar boy whenever I was seven years old. And there yeah. was something about that pageantry and just being in this large physical space, you know, this yeah. big, cavern that made me feel so small in a wonderful way you know and that's yeah. something that i i carry that you know with me i i, I sure. love entering the theater or, or large space and you know where there's about something sacred's about to be about to happen and yes. uh, right. and you know not to get into the whole religion thing but like i'm asked all the time by young writers you know where does music come from and guess what i don't know i, I don't know the answer to that i think because it's so miraculous and, and mysterious and special and and there you could spend your entire life chipping away trying to figure out where does music come from and I, you know i still would not know you know i just i just have to believe you know and, and writing is an act of faith you know i have to believe that something will occur to me something will come to me something will manifest itself and i just sit there for an awfully long time and then, <laughs> and, then it, and then it and then it comes and it usually comes like like really fast so it's right. like, get ready, you know, grab it, you know, get your recorder, try to sketch it out, try to get it. But I, there, there is something about the idea of faith that I see in my own writing, you know, just having the faith to like face something that's not there in the morning. And hopefully by the end of the day, there is something there. Right, right. And Frank, I know that you're personally very inspired by the life story of James Agee, along with its um, manifestation in the novel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the choice to put James Agee himself on stage within this piece? Sure, and I would love it if my colleagues uh, feel like jumping in because it was a really important shift in our 
yeah. perspective on the project when we uh, came to uh, realize, and I don't remember the sequence or the conversation. Uh, I, I just know we were all in exactly the same place when we realized that this narrator is James Agee and he is hunting himself. He is looking for himself. He's trying to find out who he is and why he lives and why he struggles and why he suffers. Um, so I, yeah, I will, I'll just jump in for one second, Frank, if I may. Um, we had a wonderful dinner in New York with Frank, um, Joshua, Stephen, and myself. And it, it came after our uh, reading that we had done. That's right. Um, and we realized, and I felt it so strongly that the show didn't quite have a point of view. Right. And, it, and because it lacked a forceful point of view and a forceful yes. reason to exist, it was as beautiful and, and, and elegant and um, evocative and wistful as a feather. Right. But it needed it drama. It yeah. needed passion. It yeah. needed humor. It needed yeah. oomph. Yeah. And I, I can't, I'm just a musical theater gal. It's hard for me to express things in the <laughs> elegant way that Frank Galati does, yeah. but I knew that it needed something. And yeah. over the course of <laughs> that <laughs> dinner, um, we kind of all went, oh, what if it began kind of like this? And really yeah. it is the writer himself trying to write and being unable to write, which we've all had, you know, those First. moments. We've all had the moment of yes. the blank page and the panic yes. and the, the rage. And and it starts the the show off not with a whimper, but with a bang, yes. you know? Good and you. I, I think that's that's really what we accomplished after that reading. And, and I think we were all on the, the same wavelength about it. I'll just add one quick thing. I am sitting here, I am about five miles away from where James A.G. is buried. Um, he, he had a home up here and uh, it is an, now an, a very sad, derelict, old ramshackle place in the middle of the woods. And he's buried somewhere on that property with no stone, but we know he's there. And it's, you know, and we went there the other day and Jason Danieli, who plays the role, took pictures and uh, hikes there 10 miles from his house to James Agee's house every day. So um, we're, he's, his spirit is around us here. I hope he's happy up here in upstate New York. I hope he likes <laughs> Knowing what we're, we're doing. I hope he likes musicals. <laughs> I, do. I think he would have. Oh, I'm pretty I sure. I think he I'm pretty father. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was the best dinner we ever had. Maybe it was, <laughs> that was a great we dinner. Solved so much over the course of one. We just solved the whole show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was our, uh, the, like the writing team, the director, the choreographer, uh, the the uh, the uh, Frank, you know, a, a, adapting the work of James, and we just we just talked it through and talked it through, and at the, and by the time dessert came, mm -hmm. we had solved the whole front of the show, and and we I couldn't wait for us to get back in that room to yeah see yeah. how it all. Play. And and remember when we did get back in the room, yeah, uh, uh, we were uh, uh, without really saying anything to each other. We knew it worked. Yeah, yeah. You we know, could oh, tell. oh, it works. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we were, I suppose, a little anxious about whether or not it would, but. <laughs> Uh, it, it's a very unusual and compelling springboard yeah. into the action. And uh, uh, the character of the narrator is as exciting and uh, mysterious, dark, violent, urgent as any of the characters that right. he is focused on. So, wow, it's thrilling to be able to see them all inhabit the same psychological space mm -hmm. in, uh, in a kind of harmonious agreement about the way the story is going to be told. Mm. It's, it's a bare space, 
which is like a, a, an empty head that fills <laughs> with images and memories. Mm -hmm. And as we do, those of us who, you know, work in the arts, it doesn't matter whether you're a quilt maker or a painter or a mm -hmm. potter, uh, uh, it, it, uh, well, as, as Stephen says, it just comes to you. Yeah. I, I also think the restructuring of our, the top of our show that helped me, uh, as the music person, uh, understand more about, uh, the notion we, we, we have a lot of, several of our actors play, uh, instruments throughout the evening. And that's something that we experimented with really from uh, the first reading, you know, just to see, is this a good idea? Is, th is this uh, something that we might be able to develop? And we like that, but I could never figure out a way to introduce that idea in the show. And by having James Ag at the top of the show, trying to put something on paper, trying to um, order his own ideas uh, bit by bit, a character comes out and just this uh, character just starts playing a, a country fiddle and another character comes out and starts uh, playing a, a guitar and then a third character and it's almost like he's assembling uh, the people in his life and his memories of them uh, trying to compose uh, a first sentence and in fact the, the characters themselves come out and tell him what the, the first sentence needs to be and uh, just musically, the fact that our orchestra isn't even playing, it's these actors, you know, who are coming out and bit by bit, they're assembling the score, they're creating the score. Uh, I was so excited by that, you know, and, I, and uh, I think our actors love it too, because it's hard enough, as we know, to find people that can sing, move and act. And then mm -hmm. we put this whole other fourth level of skill on top of it. Uh, but I, I think all the actors, they loved the challenge and, you know, they, they wanted to, they were all in. Are there yeah. any I just want to say we have a point. Sorry, sorry, Celine. I just wanted to say that we have the most amazing cast in the show. We were so lucky this yeah. last go around and we're hoping yeah, we're hoping um, they'll all join us again for the real production when it finally happens. But I think a couple of them are in the audience today, so I just want to say hi, guys. I know Jack Casey's hi. out there, hi. and I know Barbara Marino hi. is out there. Hi, <laughs> I don't know who else. I think it was too. I don't know. Too. Hi, guys. Oh, great. Oh, <laughs> hi. Hi. We, 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 we love our, our actors, and you know, as you know they, they just inspire us. us. Mm. Yes. Yeah. We've learned so much from them. That's about right. About the characters that we have been studying in the abstract. Uh, not entirely abstract, because Lynn and Stephen have both helped uh, 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 someone who's not in it penetrate and, and live inside of these characters and these moments. But uh, the cast is so alive, so mm -hmm. nuanced, and so uh, rigorous in their, they have such good taste. They mm. don't, they're, 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 they, if they make an excessive choice, it works anyway. But, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just so wonderful to work with people and be inspired with people who know who they are, who are comfortable, who love the light of living on stage, mm. and who have voices of, of the angels. I mean, they are. Yeah, we are remarkably stunning. lucky. Yeah. We are. We are a wonderful yes. group. Uh, you mentioned, you know, as we've been working through this show, going from reading to workshop to fully staging it, there have been a lot of changes to the piece. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what is that process in the room when you're watching something and you're inspired and you get an idea and you want to make a change. How, how do you communicate that to everybody and how, what's the process of making that happen? You, you know, it's with every, it depends on your director, to be honest. And every show is a little bit different, but basically you all, we the writers always go to the director. He's the source or the music director. If we hear something that doesn't sound right, yeah. 
or if we see something or we have a good idea, you know, like, oh, what if they did this instead of that? Uh, we always go to the director. And the wonderful thing, one of the great things about Frank that I love so much is he goes, well, go and tell them, tell them. And I'm like, no, you're supposed to do that. You know, I'm so, you're, that's your job. I, I don't want to mess around. But um, he's very generous about letting us communicate sometimes our, our um, feelings to the actors. But, you know, it, it, we're in the room every single moment of the rehearsal. Um, it, because when you leave the room, things happen. There's another word for things, but you know, yeah. <laughs> you, you come back and it's, it's, <laughs> there's something has happened that you don't like, um, <laughs> it's happened. And, uh, <laughs> um, so we're always there because we want to be involved in the process. And we, you know, we learn so much watching an actor just read a line or sing a line. Um, you know, you're always, your mind is always processing and it gives you other ideas and, so it's a very fluid and exciting process to be in that room with right. those actors and with, I, I with Josh. The, I think one of the, the cool things that happened, uh, and this happened on the last day of our of our workshop, uh, we had written uh, a song for the character of Mary, who's uh, the young pregnant woman in the show, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it sort of fell in the area of a show where the eleven o'clock number happens, you know, where like her big statement is. And we had written it as a solo, uh, but it's really about her coming to terms with her husband, what her life meant, who he was, his choices, and her ultimate acceptance of who he was as, as a human being. So that's a big number. And it started as a solo, and then I can't remember if it was Josh Rhodes or Michael Edwards, but it hap we, we had done a morning performance of the, of, uh, the show that had that song, and then somewhere in between, uh, probably over a sandwich, you know, somebody said, well, it's about him, but what if we actually bring him into the number? You know, like what if uh, the, the husband that she's lost comes back and it's a choreographed moment to a song. So we did that for the afternoon performance and it worked so beautifully. And I think we were all excited about that. And then in the time from the workshop to when we went uh, back into rehearsal uh, in Sarasota, we started, um, exploring the character of the author, James A.G., more and more. And uh, it became, well, why doesn't he sing it with her as a duet? And I think that that happened over, believe it or not, a Zoom conference call. Uh, <laughs> I, I believe it was in January because I, I, I remember we were in our own little squares like we are today. We were in our little squares. <laughs> I, I think it, I think that might have been Josh Rhodes. I, I can't remember, but I think it might have been him or he had some idea that this, and all of a sudden I thought, of course, that's exactly what it, it, it needs to be. That's exactly it. And we had a pianist in a little... Uh, rehearsal room in New York with 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 uh, uh, with Lynn and Tom Murray, our music director, and I said, "Can you just play it?" And as he was playing it, I had my little <laughs> my little phone, and I just started singing what the line could be that James A. G. would sing along with the character of Mary. So it's 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 an adult singing to the memory of his mother, who's a creation in his in his own story and in the story that he's creating and his uh, reconciliation with his father, all of that happening. And, and, and it just became so clear. And I just went like blah, 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 and then stuck it on a, on a tape and sent it to, to Lynn. And, and she came up with the words and that was it. And then we did the staging. And I think it's one of the most beautiful things. So that beautiful. Seen. I mean, we all like burst into tears. You can't mm -hmm. do you, yeah. you, there's no other choice at that point. And it's, and yeah. it's it's also a kind of a joyous cry. Right. It's not it's not a sad cry, and it's not yeah, a lonely it's a happy, cry. It's, a, it's, yeah. it's 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 very intimate, and it's full of love, and it's full of understanding, and yeah. all these characters coming together in this moment of time, and yeah. and to think we just had an eleven o'clock number for our wonderful actress, and um, and she she told me like on the third uh, Hannah Ellis, she told me in the week three of us rehearsing, she goes, you know, not all actresses would give that up. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but don't you see it's a win, 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 win for everybody and, and for the audience. And she goes, oh, I know, it's wonderful. But not everybody would give that up. Yeah, you know, that's, so. that's right. Yeah. Well, Hannah's a very generous collaborator. She's very generous. She's, and she's and very smart. Very, very smart. Because she's all about what the show, what's best for the show. Right. Yeah. You know, right. that's what I love right. about her. Yeah. 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 
That's, that's that whole story that Stephen just told is, I think, a, a wonderful um, example of the collaboration yeah. on this show and ideally on every show, but you don't get it on every show where, you know, you, you write something, somebody else says, you know, what about this? Somebody else says, we could stage it like this. The choreographer says, I could do that. Yeah. And suddenly this yeah. moment that was a beautiful moment becomes an extraordinary moment. Yes. And that's, that's yes. I think, the beauty of yes. um, this show, particularly because yes. we're all so open to one another's right. ideas, you know, because right. they're, they're all good. I think that's so true. And I think in terms of this uh, trio here in this uh, uh, late number, I I remember these conversations, and I know that my in my mind's eye I saw a kind of dance. Yeah. I thought I thought well, Jay the the husband will reappear in her mind, and they will have a pas de deux kind of thing. Mm. Well. Uh, of course, and we were all we were all having the same thoughts, and Josh was being brilliant and totally understood how we were, you know, s stepping our way into a, a whole new region. And then, you know, wouldn't you know, we get into the room, and we do it for the first time. Mm -hmm. And Ben Michael, who made his entrance from upstage right, came into the space, came forward, and his son was way downstage, facing upstage, and Ben, the father, just simply smiled. <laughs> like, oh! <laughs> That's my boy. And the kid ran into his father's arms and I mean no padre could yeah. come close yeah. to that. No. And if I had told him to do that, it would have been mechanical. Mm. Because he would be doing something that he was told mm -hmm. instead of something that really grew out of his heart. Right. So the, right. it's it's That's tremendous one. collaboration. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I forgot, we, we also added everybody else in the show. I forgot that we added them. <laughs> <laughs> so it started, oh, out, oh, it started oh, out as oh, a oh, solo. Oh, yeah. It became a duet. It became a pas de deux. It became a triangle. <laughs> and, then, and then I just saw all of these people standing in the corner near the piano, and I said, well, we don't really have a string section. Why don't we? Add those human voices, the entire spirit of Knoxville, and just add them into the number. And I was sure that we were going to hear it one time, and, and we we're going to go, "Well, that was a bad idea," and we would cut it. And, and we did it, and I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. I was just shocked, and like we, there was no discussion; it just became part of that song, right? right. You know, and it it was it was thrilling, you know. And then we stopped. <laughs> <For now. laughs> yes. we, then we paused. Then at the we end. stopped. Then we paused. But to return triumphant in 2020. Oh my gosh! Sure. Thank, thank you to uh, Oslo and Michael Edwards and Linda for. It, it was within within two weeks that we the big old pause button was hit. That felt like a stop button to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. That they talked about how can we how can we make this go forward and the fact that they. Uh, were open enough and and found found new dates for us within two weeks. That was I mean, awesome. it's astounding. Yes. Amazing. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Deep yeah. gratitude to them mm -hmm. and to the Oslo. But also, I want to acknowledge Roy Cochran and yeah. the, the Cochran Foundation. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. their commitment is so steadfast. Mm -hmm. And the fact that in this terrible emergency situation that uh, shattered our hearts to bits. Uh, they stepped up and said, you know, we will help you with additional support, uh, you know, if, if and when you need it. So we are very grateful to Roy and the foundation Absolutely. for that. Yeah, and, and Frank, you have to tell the, the, the viewers where Roy lives. This is a surprise, I think. Oh, 
Oh, and he's well, watching today. He's watching now. So hi, Roy. Really? Oh. oh, hi, Roy. Hi, hi Roy. <laughs> Roy. Roy lives in in Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> what a coincidence! <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you know what else is a crazy coincidence? What? The the circus, the miniature circus. At, yes. It, oh. Yes, yes, at the at the also at the Ringling at the, Museum the Ringling. is set in Knoxville. How's that for a wild that, thing? That that is. Oh, I, I, <laughs> you told me that. And I, I saw it I when I went know. there. I went. I couldn't believe it. I yeah. haven't been back. Since yeah, it's I on a little that. tiny plaque. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, folks, we I could I could listen to you talk for. Hours. <laughs> our audience. You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry. <laughs> Hasn't it been hours already? It has been hours. <laughs> the time has gone by so quickly. It's been such a delight. Thank you for letting us get a view into your process. It's of it's course. so generous of you to share this time with us. Um, and actually, now we we were going to take just a few minutes to get some questions from our Great. audience. Wonderful. Um, Everybody listening uh, at home, uh, you can add your questions in the comments section. There's about a 30 second delay before we're going to see it here on our screens. So we're going to start with some of the questions that were submitted in advance. And to help us uh, take a look at those questions, I would like to introduce Oslo Reps, dramaturg and literary manager, James Monahan. Hi, everyone. James. Hi, James. <laughs> so good to see you all. Thank you for this amazing conversation. It's been such a pleasure to listen to you. Um, I could go, I could gush for a while, but I've got a couple of questions that I know our audience is really eager to hear your response to. Um, I've got two that are kind of the same, so I'm going to combine them. They come from uh, Carol Becker and Annette Chris, two longtime supporters of the Oslo who've been with us forever and are, and are great supporters. They're both wondering about, um, because of the delay, very grateful that you'll be coming back, but they're wondering if there will be any more work done on the script and score and the staging between now and when it will actually uh, be on the Oslo stage. Well, I, I, ironically, uh, the final song was orchestrated on the day that we got the news <laughs> that we couldn't continue. And, and yeah, and so for the next two weeks, we were actually proofing and tweaking orchestrations that we would not hear until a year and change, you know. Yeah. So I I don't want to change the music until I hear what we had already, you know, which, which I which I we were we, we missed our first orchestra rehearsal by by a week. Yeah. So you know, I would just add to that that time is always a good thing. And yeah. sometimes things turn out to be a blessing. And you know, whenever musicals are always a rush, there you get to the last minute and you're running to that finish line and trying to get all your changes in. This is luxury, you know, in a weird way. It was very, very sad that we never got to see our sets and costumes and our actors on stage and it was very sad, but, but in a way it gives us time to reflect, to yes. get some headspace away from the show and come back to it fresh and see what we think. And you know, it gives you perspective and all that. So I, I don't know what we'll do or what will change. I think right now we're going to take a breather from it, and uh, I know that ideas will occur. Yeah, sure. yeah. And I want to reiterate that those comments. It's uh, we don't have any plans specifically. We got the, the right to the right spot right. when when the pause button was pushed, and uh, the, and I agree with Lynn. It, there's there's something about time that mm. functions in the soul. I, I, I don't. That sounds so pretentious. It's not. I think. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's it's like something is there inside of you, day after day, hour after hour, while you sleep, while you eat, when you're awake, when you're reading something else when you're totally involved in something, it's still there, you mm -hmm. hold it there. And it must be kind of like, I don't know, wine uh, uh, mellowing uh, or, or uh, a stew that just needs to cook so that the essences are, are richer. Uh, so I'm really, I, I was heartbroken, of course, and I wept like a baby, but I, like Lynn, I really realized that this is a, 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 
an opportunity to take a d very deep breath, go away and, and come back refreshed and see mm. th 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 what's so great is mm. that it puts us in the position of the audience member That's a right. little bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we can be ourselves a little bit surprised. Right, right. It'll be so fresh, and we'll say, "Why the heck do we do that?" You know, <laughs> well, that always happens. It always it? happens. Wow. Like, what were we thinking? I, I remember when we brought once in this island back, you know, uh, for this last Broadway revival, and there was this one scene, and it got to that scene, and our director said, "There's something missing," and it dawned it dawned on us bit by bit that there should have been a musical element of some sort in that scene. And mm -hmm. I said to Lynn, well, what? and then we came up with the idea. It was like inevitable. And, and I said, well, why, why didn't we do that the first time? And I think we just ran out of time. We probably ran out exactly. of time. So it was uh, like 25 years later, we were able to yeah. finally. We're still rewriting all of our shows. I mean, it doesn't yeah. end, you know, it wow. just, it, it, we're, not, all not all of them, not all of them, but some of them. Yeah, you, you think of things that, that occur once on this island. We, we yeah. wrote a little new thing for it. And, uh, you know, ragtime, we seem to keep tweak in that thing you know so anyway, okay. that's, the, yes. that's a yes. long answer to a, to a very short question all of that that's a fantastic <laughs> answer that's a fantastic answer um we're i know we're coming close to our to our deadline but i did get another question coming through over the comments um about the design of the show oh. i know that the script describes it as a clearing in the prop room of memory and it's such a great description and i know you guys are working with bob perziola for for sets and costumes yeah. could you give us maybe just a little taste of where that, uh, where that design is heading and, and how that concept came about? Well, the de designs uh, are long since completed and uh, all of the elements, the physical elements of the production exist, have been built. Mm -hmm. All the costumes are made, stitched, fitted. Uh, all the scenery is painted. Uh, <laughs> it's all in parts. Uh, I want to see it. Assemb I do too. I, I have seen <laughs> some of it, mm -hmm. but uh, it's gorgeous. And uh, the idea was, uh, I'd have to say, hard won. It was, it was not easy. Uh, we're, we're all very, very happy with the way it works, the way it feels, the way it moves as a rehearsal concept, and I think it will very much on stage. But I just want to briefly refer again to something we said right at the beginning about the fundamental change in the opening, which also occasioned a fundamental change in the way we were looking at the space. I realized, and it, it had been frustrating me, and I kind of didn't like some of the images that I saw, and yet I was committed to the idea of sky, open mm. space, mm. and and an open field of play. Uh, but I knew that um, what we were coming up with was flat and placid. In other words, it was a landscape. It was like curtain up or lights up and okay, there's the sky and there, <laughs> look, guess what? There's Knoxville, <laughs> you know, it looks like a postcard. It looks yeah. like a piece of scenery. Uh, it, 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 it's, um, it's a pretty lame launch. It, 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 it's asking the audience to believe that this canvas and paper is actually, you know, some kind of restored reality from the past. And anyway, uh, it took us a while, but we finally, and I think the workshop, both the very first reading we did mm -hmm. and the workshop we did in New York, were extremely helpful for me and Bob because with Josh's uh, introduction of the kinetic element, using these uh, pieces as Josh was using them, it made it, made it very, very 
clear that we could do the same thing and the audience would really dig it. Yeah. And it came, uh, to, we have a kind of an oval frame that's upstage center. And that came to be very important to me just because it is a frame, but mm. it's, o it's oval on its side. So it looks like uh, something tilted back. Uh, oh, maybe it's a watch. Yeah. Maybe it's a mirror. Mm. Maybe mm. it's a window. You know, there are no n n numbers on the dial, but it's got to be a pocket watch. The boy gets a pocket watch. He inherits it from his father. Anyway, that so this is all how back, back and forth feathering this element and mm. that element, yeah. a design emerges. I can't That's wait for the to see it. Uh. Yeah. So I got one more question coming through and then I think we'll have to say goodbye. But um, Celine, mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe you can weigh on in this one as well. It's oh. about um, uh, also represent the process of designing an expanded production center to allow us more capacity uh, to do great projects like Knoxville. And the question is about um, the future of those kinds of partnerships um, and how that campaign is going to give us access to those um, great relationships. Um, so maybe you start with Celine and then oh. everybody else can chime in as well. Yes, indeed. And I think everybody should know this um, This campaign is still ongoing. It hasn't been suspended, but the ability to be able to rehearse a musical in multiple different rooms, I think is, is really important to be able to have one room working on teaching music, another room where the director can be doing scene work with mm -hmm. the actors in another room where you can have the choreographer working out the, the movement is just completely invaluable. And that ability to multitask, to have a space where you can do that just puts, uh, would put Oslo up there, I think, at one of the top levels of where you can develop new work and, and really make the most out of your time, which is in the theater, uh, our most precious commodity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what do you think, folks? Uh, well, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We'll be back in a second. Oh, I mean, not great. this this show, but any show. I mean, you know, the, the, we're, we're very spoiled, really. You know, we as as people who've had the luxury of of having broadway productions uh, you know a number of them you 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 know you think oh broadway is the end all be all but in fact the the out of town experience to really develop a show properly is a luxury and it's it's it doesn't always happen that way and um, you know having had to date our experience with the oslo has been phenomenal just phenomenal. They've been so nice to you guys. They're so nice to us and have treated us royally. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, we would, we would come back even if you weren't building something new, but, but the fact that there's going to be this fantastic facility is, is, uh, I think just a very exciting possibility for anybody who writes for theater, uh, regionally on Broadway. It doesn't matter. It's very exciting. Thank you. Yes. I also remember our last afternoon together at the, at the Oslo, uh, the other actors who were in the other shows that that were in rep at that moment in right. time, they were our first audience, and right. yes. our actors were and so, only and only audience. <laughs> audience. Sadly. So us, but the, the actors were so grateful to be able to share this this new work and this this show with them, and they were a fantastic audience. You know, yeah. granted, we were yeah. a tiny little a tiny little audience in the in a small room, but boy, that was it was a fantastic way to end, you know, before the pause. And uh, right. and now going back uh, to, to the Oslo in performing the piece in the space that it was intended to be performed. Uh, and, and as we dreamed of the show, we dreamt of it being on that particular stage. Okay. And so right. yes. Um, yes. What, whatever anybody can do to, to help this theater along, I think, uh, I, I obviously, you know, they can use your help. Uh, we can use the help. And uh, it's it's an amazing place to work, and uh, we're so grateful that we'll be able to do Knoxville uh, this coming season. Yeah. Yes. And we're well very said. Happy to have you. Well, 
everyone, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much to Lynn and Stephen and Frank. We'll give you a, a virtual round of applause from wherever you're watching us today. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Knoxville opens May 21st of 2021, so you have plenty of time to get your tickets. Indeed. Thank you all for being with us and have a great evening. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye, Bye, everybody. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye. -bye.